King Ling of Chu seized his throne in the traditional manner of his state, regicide. His rule was firm and his power so complete that he decided to build the most extravagant palace the world had ever seen in which to enjoy his concubines. A pursuit of pleasure for which he would eventually pay with his life. In 589 BC, Wu Chen, newly appointed envoy of the King of Chu to the state of Qi, left the Chu capital at Ying and headed north. Wu Chen had a substantial caravan with him, carrying many of his valuable possessions. It seemed as if Wu Chen had no plans to return. Indeed, he did not. Although the road took him north, he did not go to Qi, but to Jin, Chu's long-standing rival for domination over the Zhou domains. After the death of King Zhuang of Chu, the state of Chu's most successful leader in 500 years, the court was split by a power struggle among his former members. King Zhuang's successor was a 10-year-old boy who was easily manipulated by the rival factions. Wu Chen in 党争当中失利呢，他在楚国呀待的就非常痛苦，觉得自己迟早要被杀，于是呢，他就产生了逃离楚国的想法。终于有一天呢，他得到了一个机会，楚王呢派他去出使齐国，于是他就暗中收拾了大量的金银细软，带着家眷呢就出发了。结果这个乌臣根本就没有去齐国，他逃到了楚国的对手晋国那。晋国国君呢，非常热情地接待了乌臣，封他呢做了行义的大夫。King Gong of Chu was infuriated by Wu Chen's defection. Wu Chen's rival at court, Zafan, recommended the execution of Wu Chen's entire clan as punishment. When the news reached Wu Chen, he cried out for revenge. A few weeks later, Zafan received a letter from the state of Jin. It was a short message from Wu Chen. I swear by heaven that I will keep you running without rest until death comes to take you. It was no idle threat. Wu Chen already had a plan of revenge.
The states of Chu and Jin had been bitter rivals for a century, with the advantage of power seesawing between them. Now Wu Chen proposed to the Duke of Jin that to weaken the state of Chu, they should bolster Chu's eastern neighbor, the barbarian state of Wu. Chu would then find itself having to fight on two fronts and running back and forth between the threats on each. Zhengkai The first step of Wu Chen's plan was to help Wu grow from a small and peripheral state into a powerful one, one powerful enough to contend with Chu. The people of Wu had long been living in fear of Chu's aggression. Now, Wu Chen, a man from Chu, would show them how to fight their big western neighbor. Tai Bor, founder of the state of Wu, claimed descent from the rulers of the Central Plains. He and his younger brother fled assassination by their youngest brother, King Li, and hid among the barbarian tribes of the south. They tattooed their skin and cut their hair short, as the locals did, adopting a lifestyle very different from the one they had grown up with. So 文明的这种礼，所以他说：“哎呀，不得了，礼啊！”As king of Wu, Shou Meng was eager to learn, so he treated the newly arrived Wu Chen with utmost respect. He invited Wu Chen to live in his palace and to teach him how to strengthen his army and govern his state. Wu Chen lectured to the king for days on end. Finally, Convinced of Wu Chen's vision, Zhou Meng appointed Wu Chen his chief military strategist and trusted him with all matters related to the conduct of warfare. Wu Chen sought to improve Wu's technical abilities by building large numbers of chariots and drilling complex battle formations.
Wu Qian brought with him to the state of Wu a large number of books, mainly inscribed on bamboo slips. These were precious gifts. Another gift was music. Wu Qian brought with him not only musicians, but also musical instruments manufactured in the state of Jin. Wu began to form itself in the manner of the states of the Central Plains. Next, Wu Chen encouraged Xiao Meng to begin attacks along his border with Chu. The army of Wu attacked the cities and fortresses of Chu on the border and soon seized them one by one. Wu Guo and Chu are frequently engaged in war. 而且这些战争，吴楚之间的战争，大多数都是在楚国的地盘上进行的，只有个别的战争是在吴国的地盘上进行的。那么，当时吴国是一个新崛起的一个蛮夷的小国，所以对晋国这种老牌的中原大国来说，他利用吴国来干这个事情，对他来说是以逸待劳。Zafan, as Minister of War of the State of Chu, now found himself continually organizing expeditions to protect Chu's eastern borders. He was reminded of the letter in which Wu Chen swore his revenge. I swear by heaven that I will keep you running without rest until death comes to take you. It seemed that this was becoming a reality. Zafan saw how the pincer movement between the states of Wu and Jin threatened to destroy Chu. Wu doing no more than what Chu had done in the past, trying to strengthen itself by adopting the advanced technologies of the Central Plain and expand its territory through military expeditions. However, the Central Plains culture of rights also had a softening effect on the martial spirit of barbarian tribesmen. Chu itself had lost some of that wild warrior spirit over time. Walking a 就必然造成，就是说，这这制度就是整个走向崩溃。The state of Chu had reached its highest point of prosperity by adopting the right system under King Zhuang. Now, in the years after his passing, the traditions of fratricidal succession struggles returned with a vengeance. In 544 BC, Zhang Yuan succeeded his father to become king of Chu. 
His uncle, brother to the last king, served as his prime minister. His name was Xiong Wei. But Xiong Wei had higher ambition for himself. He consulted the diviners to see if he, one day, might become the king of Chu. The omens to be read from the cracked tortoise shells were not good. In a fit of pique, Zhong Wei flung aside the cracked shell and roared, if heaven will not help me, then I'll help myself. Zhong Wei began plotting. In 541 BC, his nephew, the king, fell ill. Zhong Wei went to visit him. Finding the king sick in bed, he took the opportunity to kill him. He killed his nephew's two sons as well, just for good measure. He would be known to history as King Ling of Chu. If the omens had not favored King Ling in prospect, his early years were at least blessed by a truce with the state of Jin. After a century of confrontation, both parties were exhausted, and a common desire to bury the metaphorical hatchet would allow each to concentrate on other goals. For the smaller states, the blessing was perhaps a mixed one. While they benefit from not being co-opted into the struggles of their powerful neighbors, they risk becoming the direct object of their neighbors' attentions. Then, 与晋国的对抗当中呢，抽身出来，全力对付吴国。那么宋国的左师向荣，他一直在晋楚两国之间斡旋，他呢跟晋国和楚国呢都有交情。他看到晋楚两国的关系有所缓解，于是呢就提出
他实际上是一种称霸的一种女性。他把彰化台做好了之后，他当时想为这个彰化台举行一个盛大的一个罗成典礼，结果呢，就向这个各个诸侯国去发出这个邀请信。他喜欢卖弄，他喜欢炫耀。那么有些人就看不惯你这一点，就觉得你凭什么好炫耀的？你就是做了一个一个一个一个一个行宫吧，你这种行宫完全是一种奢侈的一种表现。你要我们的仿效，所以说可能中了很多国家就不吃，都不愿来楚国参加这个罗成典礼。但是也有国家，就是比如说鲁国，他出于自己的考虑，就是鲁国恰恰你一直帮呢，他非常注重建筑文化，他想的话，我来学习一下也未尝不可。Duke Zhao's father, Duke Xiang, had once visited the state of Chu and had been much impressed by its architecture. When he returned to Zhao, he ordered the building of a Chu-style palace in his capital city. As Chu rose to become an influential state, the word Chu came to indicate the exotic and the fashionable. Chu became a trendsetter, be it in architecture, dress, or music. Growing up in his father's Chu Palace in the state of Lu, Duke Zhao couldn't help but be curious about the state of Chu. He wanted to know what magic had transformed Chu from a barbarian state to a civilized kingdom. King Ling's palace was called the Dream of the South of the River. Its exact site had long been lost to history. However, in 1987, an archaeological dig at Long Wan in Hubei unearthed an unexpected hall of relics. With a pathway paved with shells, it seemed possible that this might indeed have been the site of the royal palace of Chu. The shell paving is described by the ancient poet and minister of Chu, Chu Yuan, in his nine songs, a purple shell court before the Vermilion Palace. According to the commentary of Zor, in 535 BC, the Chu built a huge palace by a lake. The palace was so high that the serving maids had to rest three times when climbing to the highest levels. However, the maids may have been somewhat weak from hunger. King Ling was well known for his love of girls with very narrow waists, so the maids in question probably starved themselves in the hope of attracting his favors. Duke Zhao's visit to Chu proved an eye-opening experience. The Duke was impressed not only by the architecture, but also by the Chu bronzeware. At the time, smelting and casting techniques in Chu had advanced well beyond that of the other states. When the Duke attended the banquets thrown by King Lin, he saw Ding, the ceremonial cauldrons, quite different from the solid, dumpy items of the northern states. 
The two designs were characterized by more complex curves and rich detailing with a nod to royal taste in their narrowed waists. Young 有一个空空的空空的空空的空空的空空的空空的空空的空空的空空的空空的空空的空空的空空的空空的空空的空空的空空的空空的空空的空空的空空的空空的空空的空空的空空的空空的空空的空空的空空的空空的空空的空空的空
The right system not only helped King Zhuang become overlord of the whole of China, but also provided Chu with the opportunity for rapid technological and economic development. The removal of the threat of war with Jin after 546 BC would have further accelerated this. However, King Ling's lust for pleasure became a curse to his kingdom. Chu 一种优秀In the winter of 530 BC, King Ling sent troops to lay siege on the state of Shu. It was an unprovoked attack. As the king led the main body of his army, they found themselves caught in a heavy snowstorm. The rarity of this freak event in South China distracted the king from his campaign. He set aside his plans and set off to enjoy the novel scenery. His minister, Zaga, became worried. He stopped King Ling's vehicle and knelt down before it. He implored his master with the words. In the old days, King Mu of Zhou busied himself with all sorts of games. To remind King Mu of his duty, priest Mo Fu wrote a poem for him. Can you remember those verses? No, replied King Ling. Zaga recited them. But unlike King Mu, King Ling ignored his loyal counsel and continued with his distractions. It would not take King Ling long to discover the consequences of his willfulness. In 529, with King Ling away from his capital, his youngest brother, Qi Ji, recruited Ling's two other younger siblings and plotted a coup. They seized the capital, Ying. As King Ling raced back to assert himself, his army deserted him. Qi Ji had promised the soldiers an amnesty and full retention of their rights if they were to join him. King Ling's support evaporated. He had exploited his people for far too long. Now, not even the merest handful of retainers would follow him. Exhausted and hungry, King Ling passed out under a tree. The man whose pride had been the largest and most extravagant palace in the world now found himself with nowhere to rest. He would never see the palace again, except perhaps in his dreams.
When King Ling awoke under the tree, he realized he could never reclaim his throne. There was only one thing to do. He took off his delicately woven silk belt and hanged himself. The building of the palace became a symbolic point in the rise and fall of the state of Chu. Intended as a symbol of Chu's glory, it became a curse to the king that willed it and to the people of Chu who were taxed and exploited to build it. 中原的这个高度文明，它能够迅速提高一个边缘国家的社会生产力，能够积累大量的物质财富。但是，一旦充分的领略了中原文明的硕果，这些边缘国家就开始患上中原病。A thousand years later. The Northern Wei Dynasty, which rose from the Xi'an Bay, Turkic nomads of the northern grasslands, to rule much of North China, suffered a comparable fate. They pursued a policy of deliberation Sinicization, including compulsory intermarriage and the adoption of Chinese customs. However, after Emperor Shao Wen moved the capital from Datong in North Shanxi, south to Luoyang in 494 AD, the rulers became so estranged from their base support of grassland warriors that the regime dissolved into inter-Sinian struggle. Xiao Huangdi 改革就是把四家大族的这一套制度全盘了搬到了他们的尖兵族里面去，不是因为他们进了中原。而是因为他们接受了汉民族当中的那个贵族制度，使得自己贵族化，贵族化了，他就迅速走通了腐败的道路。When a barbarian state adopted the Chinese system, the first thing that went by the wayside was their warrior spirit. The Jurchen people, who established the Jin dynasty, were another example. After seizing North China from the Song dynasty in 1125 AD, they too were seduced by the entertainments and pleasures the Chinese were accustomed to. Their warriors became lazy and cowardly. Before marching to war, they'd cry on the sleeves of their relatives. This phenomenon was already seen in the spring and autumn period. Lohol民族征服人家同时比先进的文化所征服,这个是必然的。当他们吸收了那些所谓正统的那些民族,他们的悠长之后,或者融入这些民族之后, Tamanwan 就是危險已經悄悄地要來臨。The conflict between Wu and Chu continued for decades as a peace in the wider power struggle between the major states of the spring and autumn period. But sometimes it was also, quite literally, a blood feud of the most personal nature.
King Ping succeeded to the throne by a dint of a deception, remarkable even by the standards of Chu. When he returned to the Chu capital after King Ling's army had deserted him, Prince Qi Ji, as he then still was, persuaded both his two elder brothers to commit suicide. He told them that he had been defeated by Ling, who was now advancing on the city, bent on taking a cruel revenge. As King Ping, Qi Ji proved the match for his elder brother in terms of finality and corruption. Conspiracies continued to abound. During the reign of King Ling, Minister Wu Ju was famed for being able to offer direct criticism to his monarch. King Ping appointed Wu Ju's son, Wu Xia, renowned for his intelligence and loyalty, to be tutor to his own son, Prince Jian. When Prince Jian showed favor to Wu Xia, this made Fei Wu Ji, another of Prince Jian's tutors, very jealous. Xiao 于是就把本来给儿子娶的媳妇呢，自己拉为妃子。The incident scandalized the Chu aristocracy. Fei Wu Ji was fearful of the crown prince's revenge and tried to further poison the king's heart by suggesting that Prince Jian and Wu Xia were plotting to overthrow him. Prince Jian fled into exile, but the loyal Wu Xia stayed. King Ping then ordered the execution of Wu Xia and his entire family. For generations, the Wu clan had been one of the leading families in Chu society, enjoying the privileges and benefits of high office. Now at a stroke, it was all to be annihilated. But Wu Xia had one son who escaped the bloodbath. In 522 BC, Wu Zexu fled across the wild borderlands to the state of Wu. There he found sanctuary with the enemies of Chu.
16 years later, Wu Zixu would return to Chu at the head of an army of 30,000 men. While his father and brother had chosen loyalty as their end, Wu Zixu chose a different path, the path of justice and revenge. Wu Zixu was a man on a mission. In 506 BC, with 30,000 warriors from the state of Wu behind him, he invaded his native land of Chu. For the kings of Wu, this was to be the crowning moment of the long struggle between the two states. For Wu Zixu, it was the culmination of his life's work and deeply personal.